So, hey guys, I'm Navni Plaha. You guys should know my name by now, though. We've been to school together for three years, and I will be teaching you guys about molecular clocks. So, I'm going to start you guys off with a question to get the juices flowing. Very simple question, it's just review. Genetic variation in a population is due to the accumulation of A. Favorable mutations, B. Unfavorable mutations, C. Neutral mutations, or D. None of the above, the Earth is 6,000 years old and evolution is a hoax. I'm going to give you guys a moment to think about it. Okay. So, if you guys got neutral mutations, then good for you. If you got D, then you really haven't understood the point of this project, have you? The molecular, now I'm going to explain to you why the answer was C. The molecular clock follows the whole idea of natural selection. I know you guys know this by heart by now, but I'll say it again. Beneficial mutations are proliferated in a species, while disadvantaged mutations are not. We know this because useful mutations allow an organism to survive and reproduce in their environment. However, an organism with unfavorable mutations dies, so the mutation doesn't flourish. So now you know that the answer can't be unfavorable mutations because the species just dies. I mean, like, the organism just dies before it can really reproduce. But it can't be A either because favorable mutations are very rare. So the answer has to be C. Genetic variation must be an accumulation of neutral mutations. And that is known as neutral theory of evolution. So, what are molecular clocks? A molecular clock is a clock used to measure evolutionary time on the basis that neutral mutations are occurring at a constant rate in the species. It works by measuring random changes in the DNA, or as we all know, neutral mutations. Oh, and scientist Linus, Linus Pauling and Emil Zuckerkandel first came up with the theory of molecular clocks. So here's some history behind the clock. Scientists Linus Pauling and Amir Zucker Candle um, like, uh, saw that evolutionary changes occurred at a constant rate in 1962. Now, this theory was just based on empirical observations, but then was later backed by another scientist, Mutu Kimura, who developed the neutral theory of evolution in 1968. However, he believed that the rate was constant throughout time and across different species. This idea was too strict because molecular uh, evolution rates are different in different organisms, slightly. So today we use a more relaxed model that allows the rate of molecular evolution to vary among species. And in case you guys were curious, this is a picture of Lance Pond. So, how does the clock work? A uh, molecular clock is a graph that shows a linear relationship. The independent variable would be time in millions of years since the species diverged. The dependent variable would be the number of changes in nucleotides between the homologous chromosomes in the two species. Of course, the relationship is not always going to be linear. As time passes, different generation times and mutations may cause the relationship to become more and more nonlinear. Now, on the left is a picture of a molecular clock from the textbook. It's a graphical. So let's take the first bullet point shown. Only a small amount of time has passed since the two species first diverged, and therefore only a few nucleotide differences have occurred, as you can see. Um, and then, let's flash forward. Now it's been a lot of time, let's just say 30 million years, picked a number out of the year. And now look at the last bullet point. A lot of time has passed. And as you can see, a lot of nucleotide, there are also a lot of nucleotide differences between the two species. Um, so, basically this helps you drag the point down. As more time passes since species, species originally diverged, the more nucleotide differences are accumulated between them. And the second picture is for those who are still having a little trouble understanding the concept. Let's take a common ancestor and this is its nucleotide sequence. Um, now, it diverges, and 25 million years later, the first species that has diverged, let's say species A, has now had one nucleotide change, a T to a G. Now, the second species has also had one nucleotide 
that was changed. A G to a T. Now, flash forward, it's been 50 million years later. Now there are two nucleotide changes between the two species. A T turns into a C and a T turns into a G for species A. And for sp the second species, a C turns into a T and a G turns into a T. And as more time will pass, there will be more nucleotide differences between them. Now, molecular clock calibration. How does one determine the rate of nucleotide changes among the species? Well, they first need to know when the two species diverged. Scientists usually figure this out by using fossil records. Then, they take the amount of di nucleotide differences between the two species currently, and then divide that by the time passed since the species diverged from one another. This gives you the rate of nucleotide changes. This is a very important formula for my section, and you guys should know it. It's fairly simple. So, genes. Different genes are analyzed to study phylogeny. Slow-changing genes are useful for determining very distant evolutionary relations. A great example of this is SSURRNA. It is in every single living organism in the world. And since it is in every organism, we know that it's existed for a very long time, and it's slow-changing. So scientists can use genes like this to place organisms into their proper order. However, there are swiftly changing genes, like mitochondrial DNA, that can be used to analyze two closely related species with lengthy generation times because they have a very similar DNA. Okay, in this example, we're, I'm going to show you how we use rapidly changing genes, in this case cytochrome oxidase subunit 2 DNA, and analyze closely related species. Branch A shows that there was once a species, Ancestor A, that branched into Cymanx and another species that I just like to call Ancestor B. Then Ancestor B branched into orangutans and Ancestor C, which then branched out into gorillas and Ancestor D, which then branched out into humans and Ancestor E, which then branched out into two different kinds of chimps, the common chimp and the pygmy chimp. Okay. So we know that Siamangs are the oldest of the six species, then orangutans, then gorillas, then humans, and then the last two chimps. So since you guys are masters at you know, molecular clocks and neutral changes, the neutral theory of evolution, answer the following three questions. Which species will have the most amount of neutral changes? Which two species are the most similar? And which of the following pair of species are more closely related? Humans and orangutans or humans and gorillas? Give you guys a moment to think about it. It's a piece of cake. Now, if you guys still need some more time, please pause because I'm going to move ahead. Okay, the answer to number one is Siamangs. Good job if you guys got it right. Now, why? Siamangs are the oldest of the six species. Therefore, according to the neutral theory of evolution and the theory of molecular clocks, they must have had the most amount of time to accumulate neutral mutations. The answer to the second question is the two species of the chimps would be the most similar. That's because the two had the shortest amount of time to accumulate neutral mutations or neutral changes. The last question follows the same logic. Humans and gorillas would be more closely related than humans and orangutans because they had a smaller amount of time to accumulate neutral changes than the other pair. Good job if you guys got all three of them right. And now it's the end. Thank you so much for watching.